don't know, do you have any responses to that? Uh, I think of, re of, of uh, when I read a text and when I write about it, one of the things I try to think about is like uh, staging it, staging the reading. I don't think, uh, uh, what, I, what that implies for me, I think that's what Derrida often does, is trying to be aware a little bit of the fact that you're not writing in a vacuum, you're, you have a, 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 a text, just as a, a, a stage director has a text or a score or whatever, and you have conditions under which you're going to pres you know, interpret that and present it, and there's a lot of leeway there, more or less, in what you can do, uh, and uh, you have to make certain decisions about what the way in which you're going to, going to, uh, to do that, and uh, you should, you know, be as uh, aware as possible of the different considerations that you're doing. In other words, I worked for many years, not many, but maybe about eight years in Germany, as what they call a dramaturg, which doesn't really exist in the U.S. because it really requires a different uh, attitude toward theater than that you can have in a, in a fully commercial theater, you know. And the dramaturg do diff does different things in, in, in Germany, in Germany. Uh, but what I did mainly was to help the director, uh, who was also in this case a stage designer, he was originally an artist, uh, in, you know, interpret the, the, the opera or the play that we were doing. And, uh, uh, and tr we were, so we would have long you know, discussions about this way a couple of years before, once it was, uh, with opera particularly, you have to work way in advance. Uh, and uh, you know, why are we doing this? What should be, you know, for example, the magic flute. It's really interesting. Uh, 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 what about the, you know, the, the, the Freemasonry, the relation to the institution in the magic flute? How, you know, what, what does that say to us today, to the audiences that are going to be seeing this? And, uh, first of all, ourselves and then audiences uh, that, are, that are like us and somewhat different from us and so on. And you know, so we would work and then uh, he would come and uh, uh, a couple months later, he would uh, come and he'd already have a maquette that is a model of the stage you know, based on uh, our discussions. And it was very exciting for me because I, I'm very good in thinking about, you know, interpreting text, but I have no experience in translating that into actual stage design, or you know, in that sense. But he was very, you know, he could do that, and so it came. We came out with it was a very good collaboration that we did, and then we would, you know, then talk about that and and, and so on. And this, you know, became for me more and more of a model for the kind of interpretation. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean, in other words, it wasn't arbitrary, uh, I don't think. We really tried to understand historically what was going on, but also historically in terms of the conditions of the performance. You have, you know, you have two historical periods and everything that, in between. Uh, and then uh, trying to figure out you know, what would be the most uh, powerful, interesting way to, you know, to, to, uh, to uh, present it. So it went back and forth that way, and we were, I think we were a pretty good uh, mix because I had a, a lot of sort of philosophical, aesthetical background. He was, you know, thought spatially in terms of scenes as a, a painter and an art. You know, he'd been originally a stage designer and so on. So, you know, that was a, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, the interpretive activity that I was doing was very, very different from what most of my colleagues in the university were doing because there, there was a sense of coming up with a meaning that would endure. And when you're working in theater, uh, uh, nobody thinks of it enduring. You know, you know that everything is ephemeral uh, in a certain sense. You know, you're working in a medium of ephemerality. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's not important, but it means that you're not trying to do something for the, for the ages in some sense, uh, et cetera. So, so uh, uh, I think that's influenced a bit, you know, my, my uh, um, thoughts about interpretation and reading in that, in, in, in that sense. You said before that you're interested in sort of like visual arts and medium. Uh, what would you say about uh, translating maybe like a Derridian uh, philosophy into a visual medium in terms of no longer literary but you know visual? Uh, well, I mean, the uh, it wouldn't be a, a one to there's no it would there's no one to one translation. Mm -hmm. It's really a, uh, if you if you try to take some of these very general thoughts that we've been looking here. Uh, it's a way of looking at uh, uh, possible uh, uh, the functioning of, of visual elements, let's say, on a stage. So, for example, I think that, I think 
I mean, without wanting to do that, uh, I think that's what we were doing to some extent. Uh, um, for example, and it was very interesting because uh, the person I was working with hadn't read really Derrida. And, you know, that wasn't necessary. If this was, you know, valid, then there had to be experiences that could be shared that didn't derive just from a reading of Derrida. You know, I, I, that, uh, so uh, he he would use a word. You know, of course, we we spoke German together. And he would use a word, he was saying, it has to be a strong übertragung. Übertragung means a kind of transfer, or, or, or it's very strange that he would use that, 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 that word, but he did. Uh, he worked with signs, uh, kind of, you know, uh, he had a sense of uh, elements on the stage functioning as, as signs. Not in a static sense, but also not, uh, not in a, uh, there would never be a kind of hyper-realism or anything like, you know, that, uh, uh, that. So that, and he, he was influenced, for example, in the artistic tradition by uh, that aspect of Bauhaus that worked in the theater. So uh, I don't know if you know somebody like Oscar Schlemmer, mm -hmm. for example, did you know, things like that there. It wasn't the same as Schlemmer, but you could, so, and it was also somebody I really valued, a lot, uh, 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 who valued what he called economy. Not, he said, you know, people that don't know what they're doing throw too much. If you, you have to have an, an idea and keep it as simple and, and, and strong as possible, you know, limit, limited the number of elements there and so on. With the magic flute, it's very a real challenge because there's so much kitsch involved in the magic flute and around it, you know, that, that uh, 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 and, and you know, there's this, I mean, I think the, 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 the opera itself is making fun of that interpretation of it. At least that's the way we, you know, we, uh, we, we, we saw it and so on. Um, so, you know, there's no one-to-one, -one, but for example, um, there's a real difference in theater between those directors who come from the visual side, who are stage designers and become directors, and those who are actors and become <coughs> directors. You can really make a difference there. There's also a difference between East and West Germany uh, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, the East Germans who have been some of the most interesting directors in, uh, in Germany, had a much more structural way of thinking, whereas the West Germans thought much more in terms of individuals. And then uh, the, uh, those who came from acting also thought much more in terms of the plot. That was what they were responding to, whereas uh, some people coming from uh, the visual side, at least in, in this case, thought much more spatially in terms, you know, what was going on would be the spatial element, the interrelation of the op would be, and so that was uh, felt to be formalistic by some of the, even actors and singers, act actors above all, who were more in the tradition of, uh, you know, the uh, identifying theater with the plot. So, and interestingly enough, there's even a kind of post-Brechtian, I mean, you would think that the Brechtian tradition in theater would uh, problematize that but it didn't as nearly as much as, uh, as, as, as one would think. For example, we did, uh, we did one of the plays we did uh, was the uh, balcony of Jean Genet, and, uh, which tells a, I don't know, uh, uh, a story is of, it takes place in a whorehouse, and uh, outside a revolution is, or some sort of, is brewing, and inside they're getting more and more worried about this, uh, and there's a, the two of the key figures are the Ma Madame Irma, who's the head of the whorehouse, and the chief of police, uh, who is her, her paramour and client at the same time. And so, uh, you know, when you first uh, get together with the actors, and that's it, you have, a, you have what they call in German a conception conversation. I love the you know, German con Konzeptionsgespräch. Where you're supposed to outline the way you're thinking about it and then have a discussion. And in the case of the of the balcony it was very uh, it was very touchy because it's very long and you have to cut it and there's a lot of stuff that would just is impossible it's much much too too florid and too long so, so this means you're cutting parts away from actors you know so that you're already cutting into their narcissism uh, badly that way so you, know, you have to, to justify that and uh, so I remember that um, uh, one of the actors there saying uh, Herr Weber do you think that something's been going on between them before, you know, before they, you know, that they, they, they're in a, this is this and that has been happening? I said, when you have a dream, do you ask yourself what happened before the dream? <laughs> that there is no before. This is it. 
you have to take it what's there and not try to put it into a realistic thing. You know, this is just like a little cutout of a real event, series of events that you happen to be dropping into or, or, or something like that. You see, this is a, uh, you know, this is, I don't know if this, I mean, I think this is in conformity with Derrida, but it's not a direct, a direct transfer of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, any, of anything, of anything Derrida, but it shows a different way of thinking about, you know, one is a basically realistic way and, uh, and the other is taking the, you know, the, the play as a play or whatever that means, because it does have elements of representational plot elements in it, but the significance of those elements uh, have to be developed in relation to what is shown and what's there, and not in relation to some sort of you know interpretation of what happened before or what might happen af a afterwards. You see what I mean? Because that's 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 not taking the play on its own terms, as it were. So you know, it's not a not an exact. There, there, I think anybody would try to do from any any. Uh, type of, of discursive interpretation. A one-to-one -one translation is a recipe for disaster. You know, it couldn't work, and it shouldn't even be thought of as, as something. You know, when you try to do that, I think you're in, you're, you're, you're in trouble. But you see, it does make a difference if you have a kind of a basically realistic appraisal of what's going on, and you try to interpret it in terms of that kind of notion of, of, of realism, or if you see these figures more like dream figures as sort of signifying different things but uh, not necessarily representing, you know, a kind of a, a, a realistic uh, cutout, as, a, as it were. That was a, at least that, but there was no, you know, we, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of conflicts. Uh, any performance like that is, is com complex, you know. It was very interesting to work in that kind of, a, when you're working in, the, in academia, you're pretty much up to yourself what you write, you know. You write, you can don't write, you do write, but, and so on. Uh, but there, you're, you're you're depending on an, an incredibly complex machine, you know, and you're making it's ne it's negotiation all the time in a certain sense. But what was interesting was that in terms of actors, there were two types of actors that we encountered, and one were the actors that really enjoyed the acting, and not ne not necessarily representing something extra theatrical on the stage, and then the others who felt. The only way they could do the things they were being called on, which were tough. For example, people had to masturbate on the stage and things like that. It's not, you know, I wouldn't want to do that, and it's very hard. And the way they could justify that for themselves was to have some sort of meaning to, to, to you know, uh, in the sense of a realistic uh, continual plot and so on. So that, that's, uh, you know, it was a difficult, difficult, uh, interesting group, group dynamics uh, uh, there, I can assure you. Yeah. Oh, where we got on that front? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, there. Um, right. But you know, so uh, uh, again, I, I do have this kind of. Uh, from that, I I, I, or I wrote a book that sort of not was directly related to that, but sort of tried to talk about these experiences. That what I gleaned from it in terms of which was this theatricality as medium book, talking about theatricality, not so much about theater, because I don't consider myself. I'm not a theater person. I'm, it's very technical. It takes a lot of. Uh, of, of work and experience that I didn't have. I was always doing this on the side, you see. But theatricality, I had a sense of something, you know, that, that, that I could talk about, that, uh, which had to do with performance, which had to do with uh, staging uh, uh, in a general sense, in the way in which you can stage a text, let's, let's say, and so on. So, so um, and, you know, uh, 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 um, maybe this is a segue, let's see how we're doing with time. This is a segue to the, at least just the one thing I want. I, I want to say at least one or two things about the Nietzsche text. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Uh, Nietzsche is. Uh, um, the, uh, you talk about the eternal return with Nietzsche, right? And even Heidegger, who has a great one of the great merits of in the in the 30s already, in a in a quite hostile environment, defending the importance of the eternal return for Nietzsche's thinking, both in, in an environment which that was, that was really uh, 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 seen as, 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 as suspect. You know, there were, there were like official Nazi readings of Nietzsche, uh, one of them is by an intelligent man named Ernst Bertram, he, uh, who says, you know, this is already Nietzsche going off the deep end, and this is not the Nietzsche we want to, uh, you know, uh, in our new state, uh, uh, 
courage and so on. And Heidegger said, no, you have to take this very seriously. And uh, he wasn't the only one who, did, who said that, but he did say, he did defend, defend that. And uh, uh, one of the things that's, that, however, that distinguishes Nietzsche, even Heidegger talks about the thought of the eternal return. And I, uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier when we were discussing just briefly about this. There are a, different, a, a number of different uh, elements in this Nietzsche's relation to the eternal, what's called the eternal return or eternal, eternal recurrence. And uh, uh, you can divide it into a number of different uh, moments. One is very important where he, he sort of is overwhelmed by, by this thought. It, it comes over him. It really comes to, like the Unheim, which comes to you. Uh, he just, uh, uh, the, the one text is where he uh, describes himself walking in Sils Maria, and, and all of a sudden he stops short and he sees himself before a big heap of rock. And by the way, this, this rock is on the internet. You can, and, and it's horrible because on the rock you sort of have a little plaque saying here's where Nietzsche, you know, discovered the eternal, you know, return or had his first encounter with it, which is, you know, both appropriate and totally inappropriate, really because the plaque is so conspicuous in the picture. But there was no plaque when Nietzsche's walking there. And what's, what's, uh, uh, what, what's interesting is that it's sort of, uh, it's this big mass of rock that confronts him uh, at, in this mind-boggling thought that he says, he says 6,000 feet above man and and, 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 and the sea level, uh, this, this incredible thought came. He doesn't say what it is at the time, but it's clear that that's what it's going to be. And he does, but he, he relates it to this rock, you know, which is already very, you know, why? Why a rock? What is, why should a thought be a rock? And in what sense is it, is it, is it a rock? I tend to see it, uh, it doesn't take a lot of argument to flesh out for you, but if you remember, I, I talked about Freud's secondary revision, and Freud says at a certain point, it's never been really noticed in the determination of dreams, that when the dream doesn't succeed in successfully revising and, 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 and imply, giving a kind of continuous narrative to the, to the, the, the manifest dream, you, you know this because you're confronted with a big mass of inchoate thoughts. I think this is something similar to, you know, in other words, you have the rock is something that stops him short in his, in his he's taking a, a mountain hike, like, you know, everybody takes walks here. So in a, in a, in a hike, you know, you, you go from, you're going from point A to point B, you have your, your things telling you where you are, how high, how many more minutes, when you should be getting to the next one. It's all charted, you know, charted out. And suddenly, bang, there's this rock. It's like he stops him short in his, in his tracks. And that's the first, in, the first time, apparently, according, he writes about that later in Eke Homo, uh, looking back, but that's an interesting way he described it as this, 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 uh, this incredible m m block, I think is the word he uses, block. Of course, I don't, have the, I don't have the text here. A block, and I think it's important, it blocks his progress. The eternal return, whatever else it is, is not something that's gonna enable him to move forward or to keep a forward movement toward a direction is something that's going to stop, make him stop short at a certain point. And whatever other movement there is, it's a different movement from the movement moving forward or moving in a direction you intend to go. That, so the first thing is that. The second text that he then talks about going through chronologically, which is in the gay science, uh, is where he tells about, it's written in a very, uh, at the very end, I think, of book three of the gay science, it, very hypothetically, he says, what if one time a demon were to come to you and, and steal up to you and, and then whisper in your ear, and, you know, and then you get to sort of the, the, the idea of the eternal return. Again, I don't have the, the unfortunately, the text uh, right here, but it, part of it is, is, will be repeated then in, the, in this. Uh, so the second point is you get a kind of personification it's not just stopping short. Now the thought is going to be articulated, but it's still something that comes from this demon, from some power or spirit that is both outside him and yet somehow uh, knows exactly, is intimately related to him. In other words, again, Agamben has written very well on the notion of the genie, uh, the genius, and the, uh, the there as that, uh, that aspect of, of the, the subject that can't be integrated into the eye, but that it can't be separated either. 
And uh, it's a little bit like that, uh, that, that he then describes it. And the text you have before you in, in, in Zarathustra is the third. Now, in all of these cases, the thought is getting sort of articulated. But it, it isn't just a thought. And what distinguishes uh, Nietzsche's encounter in all of these cases from uh, more traditional examples of what, be, what could be called eternal return. There's a book, for example, by a Romanian named Mircea Eliad about the myth of the eternal return. If you read that, you see it has nothing to do, I think, with the, the, the way Nietzsche is experiencing that. It has to do with a kind of cosmo, it's a cosmological thought of, of things, you know, repeating themselves and so on. But it's missing something, one thing that's very crucial. It has, and this is, what, well, this is the reason I'm talking about it to you here and now. It, the eternal return that Nietzsche experiences has to be experienced as a singular experience. It's directed to him. This is, again, the, the, in a way, the Protestant moment where Luther says, you know, you have to know that you are being addressed even though you can't be sure how and what and what the consequences are, you in your you know, isolated or singular existence. And this is what uh, uh, changes it. This is what distinguishes it, up to a certain point at least, from any cosmological <coughs> speculation. Later on, in the later fragments, The Will to Power, you have Nietzsche going back and reflecting on some of the implications of the eternal return. And there it begins to look like something cosmological, you see. So it really depends. There isn't just, I don't believe, there isn't just one thought of the eternal return. There are a number of different forms that it takes, and what I think is absolutely <coughs> distinctive, and in my reading, most powerful, what I would react most powerfully, uh, what, what impresses me most, is where he describes how individually this overcomes him and the effects on his, on his existence that this has, you see. And uh, the way, uh, it, the most elaborate form it takes is uh, th that of a scenic <coughs> representation. In other words, uh, uh, the individuality is not just Nietzsche abstractly, but it's Nietzsche situated, mm -hmm. or it's a figure, as Zarathustra, in a certain place, in a certain situation. And it, uh, it, it, uh, the thought has to come to him, if it is a thought, uh, it has to come to him, or it has to break out of him, or it has to be, be experienced in a specific situation. And this is crucial, I think, for it, because the whole, everything that has to do with recurrence changes if you don't insist on the, the, the irreducibility of the individual experience of recurrence. See, In other words, it has a kind of traumatic, shattering effect on him only because it is something that takes over his whole individual uh, being, as it were. It's not just an abstract thought. You know, what if everything, uh, you know, weren't just there once, but what if it came, you know, many, many times? What if uh, anything you could imagine or anyone could imagine uh, had already been once and would always be again identically without any change? All of that uh, would be very different uh, if it didn't have the relationship to this sense of singular existence, you see. Uh, that's why I, I, uh, why I see this, this uh, related to a certain uncanny and uh, a tradition which is also involves the, the tension between singularity and doubling and recurrence and so on. It's when, when you break that down and make it into objectified cosmological uh, theory, you're talking about something different. You, it may, you, know, you can call it eternal return, of course, but it's not what is responsible, I would think, for the power and the fascination of, of, of Nietzsche. Yeah. If you want, let me try to break. I, I don't know if you know this movie, but they made a movie called When Nietzsche Wept. No, I, no. It was half half, but um, they have the passage of the eternal return, and I have it on my computer. It's four minutes long. When it first occurs to him, when he talks about oh, the great. passage from the gay science. Yeah, read it. 341. What if some day or night the demon were to steal after you in the loneliest loneliness? I, the whole video of him saying that, the actor, I have it. So uh -huh. We can hook it up and have yeah. a break. We can watch it. Okay, great. Great, absolutely. That'd be terrific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you see already, you know, the loneliest, loneliest loneliness. You see, that, that, that's the, that is the point. Uh, or that is an essential dimension of the point. Uh, of the point. And that is what, that's why I'm situating him uh, in this post-Reformation, you know, uh, uh, experience of solitude, of, of, of the, the quandary of the singular. 
of the singular. At the same time, uh, a quandary because there is also a necessary relation to something more than just the singular. I mean, that's crucial. This is not a monad. It's not a kind of, that's why, that's the distinction between the individual and the singular. The individual can be understood as something that is somehow the model for reality. You exist in a world where, uh, of individuals. Each individual is self-contained, is self-same, is the author, and so on, and you can communicate with other individuals, and differences are in between, but differences are not within the individual. The singular is this related to this iterability there. It's something that's divided in itself, that is estranged from itself, and that therefore is constitutively related to others in its isolation, in its solitude, because it is other to itself in some extent. You experience yourself as other. And this experience of self as other is, I think, uh, uh, one of the key points in the eternal, in the eternal return. That's why he, he talks about it as my abysmal thought. You know, uh, and the word there uh, is interesting in the context of Descartes. Descartes says, if I can't find some firm ground under my feet, I'm going to drown, uh, and I can't even swim. The word there is ground. In German, the word for ab uh, abyss is abgrund. It's where the ground is failing. You see, uh, 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 every time I say abysmal, or you know, in English, I always think of abyssal. Uh, it sounds like Yiddish or something like that. Abyssal this or that or. You know, there isn't really an ordinary word, but it, but in in the in German it's an ordinary word. Interestingly enough, the German experiences apparently you know makes the, the the abyss not just a kind of romantic thought, but something you know pretty familiar. Uh, Germans are familiar with the abyss and so on, and, uh, and that shows in, the, in their language. And uh, so it's internal, but it's it's the internal lack of ground. There's no ground in. And that's, 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 that, I think, is, is... And then it's uncanny in the sense that the, the thought is going to be uh, uh, everything that I am experiencing and the whole scene in which I am participating has already been, therefore it's only a repetition, and it will always be again. But where does that leave the singular being? You see? And uh, one doesn't understand, I think, why this is a it has a kind of traumatic force if one doesn't see that as a problem. You know, and I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the problem is that, the problem is that uh, um, it's saying two impossible things, or two things impossible to reconcile. It's saying that the experience of repetition uh, can be reproduced identically without any change, but it's saying that with respect to an I. And in order for the I to experience the experience of recurrence without changing, it has to experience it as absolutely unique each time. Uh, one of the par in, one of, in other words, there's no memory. There can't be memory. Uh, and it's very interesting, I don't know if we have time to do this, but in the, uh, at the center of, his, of this scene, one of the key points is when there's sudden, uh, suddenly a memory imposes itself on him. Maybe we can just read that and then we'll take a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, um, take, take a break there, this is on page 142, um, where he's just describing this gateway, uh, the moment where you have the two ways uh, running uh, that, that uh, uh, come together at the gateway there on the top. They, uh, oh, I know, I wanted to, the re one of the reasons I, wanna, I wanted to read this is that um, at the top of 142 in the English you see um, uh, you know, these two ways, one going infinitely back in the future, in the past, the other going infinitely in the future, they come together at this, uh, at this gateway, the moment, and he, it's in the English they say they oppose one, one another, these ways. They directly controvert one another. And here in this gateway do they meet. Now in the German, it's, it's a very bodily metaphor that's used. The, the meta, in German, it's Sie stoßen sich vom Kopf. Literally, they push away from each other from their head. See? It's like they're coming together physically, the path. They each have a head, and instead of meeting in a head, they push away. So it's like splitting the head, you see. The head as a kind of bodily uh, 
a, a metaphor for the unity of consciousness or something like that. The head is where late, uh, uh, the head is where it all go, uh, goes on. So it, it's in a way it's physical, singular, and much stronger than simply they oppose one another. They directly that, that all sounds logical. They have a but when they they sich vom Kopf verstoßen is a is really a strong sense of revulsion of repulsion of of, of negative negative you know. Uh, 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 pushing away there physically, and so I just wanted to, to, to mention that. And then you ha you know so then you have him describing this: uh, are not all things thus knotted so fast together? Middle of the page, that this moment draweth after it all that is to come, and therefore itself also. So the moment that uh, is going to recur uh, drags itself into this infinite recurrence. And he said, for all that can run, even the length of this long road, must run it yet again. And now, and this is also in the earlier text that, that you have from the gay science. And this slow spider that creeps in the moonlight, and this moonlight itself, and I and thou in the gateway, whispering together, whispering of things eternal, must not we all have been before? And must we not come again and run the length of that other road before us, this long, haunted road? Must we not return eternally? All of this in question, interrogative form, whis being whispered uh, uh, there. But also totally singular. The singular, the spider, and then the condition of seeing the spider, which is the moonlight, and, and, and the moonlight itself, and so on. All of that comes. And then, and then something strange happens at that point. Thus I spoke, and ever more softly. This I'm like. I'm curious how this goes in the film, by the way. For I feared my own thoughts, and the thoughts behind my thoughts. Uh, then, of a all of a sudden, I heard a dog howl nearby. You know, acoustical again. Notice. Up to now, everything is visual. Um, and had I did I ever hear a dog howl so, in this way? My thoughts ran back. Yes, when I was a child, in my most distant childhood. Then I did hear a, a dog howl, and saw him, moreover, with his hair bristling, head upturned, quivering at deadest midnight, when even dogs believe in ghosts. So that suddenly this memory of the dog howling, he hears a dog howling, it, remi it reminds him of another dog howling when he was a kid, uh, the dog is howling out of terror in the moonlight and it's because the dog believes in ghosts. Um, so that I, and why? And then he goes on to describe this memory scene. So that I pitied him. And even at that moment, the full moon passed above the house, is in the memory, in death-like silence. At that very moment, he stood, or actually it stood, it should be the moon. The moon stood a glowing disk, motionless upon the roof, as though it, not he, were, were a trespasser. That, therefore, was the dog afraid, for dogs believe in thieves and ghosts. And as again I heard that howling, again I felt that pity. So in other words, you get this memory uh, based on the howling, which then, then he's going to be projected back into the scene. Totally changes. It's interesting to see the. I, I see this very cinematographically. But first, you know, he 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 thinks the thought. You see the spider and the the moonlight and so on. Then he hears a dog howling. Remembers uh, this scene, and the dog is terrified. It's terror uh, here. Why is the dog terrified? Because of two things. Because the dog confuses or interprets the reflection of the moon on the house as, a, as a, a, a thief taking over the house, but also as a ghost. So you have property, the property of the home. The home is in, is, is, is in danger, and you have life being, in some sense, confused with death, because it's also a ghost there. So it all comes together, this uncanny of the home, no longer protecting life against death, but open to being expropriated, being to, to, be, to thieves and so on, and then suddenly, uh, he, he, he looks around, as it were, and sees the, everything that was there is no longer there. Whither was the, where was the dwarf gone now? And the gateway, and the spider, and our whispering. Did I dream on it? Was I dreaming or waking? 
Suddenly, between wild cliffs, I stood desolate, in most desolate moonshine. And then it goes on. We don't really have the time now to go on to this next thing where he sees a shepherd uh, uh, choking on a serpent that's moved into his mouth and so on and, 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 and screams at a certain point, bite its head off, bite its head off. And the shepherd bites its head off. And then the shepherd laughs wildly, hysterically. And uh, Zarathustra is totally uh, uh, taken by this wild laughter. For, for, did I ever hear uh, uh, such laughter before, and so on, and, and, and so on. There's a lot of, obviously, a lot of interpretation. All we have time, really, we're going to take a break in a second. We'll come back and look at that, and then if we have time, at least one, a scene of the, uh, of the other, um, is uh, the, this sudden outbreak of a memory uh, uh, organized acoustically, which is a memory both visual, but also of the fear of being dispossessed and the fear of being threatened by ghosts. So, <clears throat> so that the, the thought of the eternal return, far from confirming, uh, you know, you, you might think it's a consoling, reassuring thought. I'm here, uh, and I'm going to be there, I'll come again, and I've already been, and so on. But it's not experienced that way. You see, it's experienced as terrifying. Uh, because, in a way somewhat similar to iterability, it destroys the self-evidence of property, of ownership, of self-identity, you see, uh, and of the independence of life from death by creating the ghost, which is the, the mixture of both, of death and life, as, you know, as it were. And in that sense, it becomes a kind, I think, of negative resurrection or uh, problematic type of resurrection. Nietzsche himself later on will say, this may look like resurrection, but it actually is quite different talking about the eternal return, you know, and so on. Uh, it's also kind of a, a slip from the moment to the universal, right? It's sort of... You see, it's a, it's, it, it, it seems to be uh, uh, the introduction of a universal as a kind of infinite repeatability. But the problem is the I. The problem is the singularity. In order for it to repeat, the I has to... Ex it, it, it makes no difference. The I has each time will experience only as being singular, you see. So that really problematizes a lot of what he'll go on to say of... Uh, you know, uh, affirming it and so on, because the eye doesn't allow it. Uh, it. This is not an eye that remembers that it already, it just thinks that it must or may have been and it may come again, but the actual experience is one of dispossession, not of, not, not of possession. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, that's uh, 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 crucial to it. At the same time, it seems to me it's a sort of a intuitive awareness that something like what Derrida is describing as iterability is constitutive of the I, but at the same time, it's its condition of possibility and instability at the same time. It doesn't, doesn't uh, fill the gap, it doesn't fulfill the expectation of a resurrection that would give the I eternal life, let's say. You see, and it has to do with memory and with, uh, and with recurrence and so on, and, uh, and there. So that's sort of a... My sort of quick reading of it. In that, if, if that's true, you see why this thought of the eternal return is not just reassuring or consoling, but really uncanny and uh, and and terrifying at the same at the same time, because it's very familiar. It involves the the desire to repeat and the the, the process of repetition through which something like identity is created. But it says that that repetition will not bring you what the eye what is sufficient in order to overcome anxiety. You see, and so then it throws you back on that anxiety. And, and by the way, nothing is more interesting than Heidegger's interpretation of the howling dog. Uh, uh, he's totally contemptuous of that dog. <laughs> For him, the dog is really, you know, something that has to be overcome, and this is all has to be overcome. And suddenly Nietzsche becomes a kind of a Bildungsroman, a kind of a educational process, you know, where Nietzsche is able to get beyond this. But this is the most, for me at least, the most powerful element in the whole in the whole story. So it really, you know, if, if it, it's hard to find an objective, I, you, can make, you can make an argument why that is for me and why it might be for others, but I can't, if you say, no, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't move me, it's not interesting, you know, I, I don't see how I can, you know, compel you to, <laughs> I can't show you mathematically that you should be, you know, uh, moved by it e either. So, but, but it's there, you see. I mean, you can't deny that it's there. 
And uh, you can either say it's a transition, it's something he overcomes, and that the real eternal return is when he starts thinking about it, makes it into a part of a cosmological system. But I think, for me, the most powerful element, at least, is this element of, 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 of terrified confrontation with this idea of, uh, and also the, the way it's then staged, and so on and so forth. Uh, this film started a vogue uh, now you can get about you know 50 different Marat Marais CDs, and, and it, it really awakened an enormous interest in, in the music, but I think also in, in, in the period. Um, and it is the period uh, more or less parallel to the wars of religion, you see. So it's very, very much, very close to this whole question of the, the Reformation and the Protestant, uh, uh, yeah, Protestant um, Catholic d divide. And um, in, in, in France, uh, there were a group of Catholics associated with the Abbé de Port-Royal. They also did a famous grammar of Port-Royal. Uh, and there was a movement uh, associated with a priest called J J Jansen, Jansenists. And they represent, within French Catholicism, a movement that was very, very close to, in many ways to Protestantism. Uh, in their, in their, and they were finally banned uh, uh, several years later. And the, in the film, you you get that in the in the tension between Marin Marais, who is de depicted in the film as a young, uh, up and coming, brilliant musician playing the viola da gamba, and his teacher, who's we, we don't even know his first name. The teacher's name is Saint Colomb, Colomb de Saint Saint Colomb, and this. It was a teacher. Who, this it was a teacher who was very close to the Jansenists, and you'll see him. He's always wearing black, almost always. And uh, Marat Marais is is a young man on the make who makes it big uh, in the court of Louis the Fourteenth. So he's a, he's mainstream, you know, in that sense. But a brilliant musician, and he he uh, in the, we won't see all of this, but this is the sort of briefly the the, the story. He, uh, uh, Saint Cologne lives a very reclusive life, in, about 50 miles from Paris, with his two daughters, his wife having passed away. We'll see that in the first, in the first scene, his uh, young wife. And uh, very contemptuous of mundane success, but also of everything connected with the court and so on. At a certain point in the film, um, and he's very, very well known uh, for his incredible innovations and composer, compositions and playing of the viola. Uh, he adds a seventh string to the viola, which is low, and which gives it an, in an increasingly melancholy, allows it to, you know, uh, gives it a melancholy tone that's very, you know, striking. And he also composes, but he doesn't publish. And he keeps everything to himself and to the very small circle of friends that he has in his, in, 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 where he lives. And is very, you know, really at odds in every way with the splendor of the court. And here's this young, uh, uh, this young musician, Marat Marais, who comes and tries to be accepted as his pupil. And at first, he rejects him completely because he tells him, you know, you're, you, uh, you play very well, your technique is impressive, uh, but it's not music. Uh, 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 the young Marais doesn't understand this you know, at all. And then uh, uh, the, the daughter uh, of uh, saint Colomb falls in love with Marat Marais, and convinces her father to give him another chance. So he comes back later, and he, uh, he again, uh, Saint Cologne wants to send him away because of their different sense of music. For Saint Cologne, music has to do with grief, has to do with suffering, and so on. And for, for Marat Marais, it has to do with, with, with uh, uh, glory and, and, and <coughs> success, and so on. And he plays, at a certain point, a, uh, a piece that he writes that's totally different in, 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 uh, in atmosphere and so on. And uh, saint Colomb is, is, is completely perplexed because he has to acknowledge that he's a great composer. At the same time, he ab abhors the use of music that's being made, made there. So he accepts him with grudgingly as, as his student. And, uh, and then the, sort of the story de developed, the, 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 the contradiction between these two, the, stu the young student and uh, who's brilliant, but has a totally different, who is progressively then integrated into the court of Louis XIV, and then, uh, but always tries to come back to his teacher to learn from him. And the teacher is just totally contemptuous, 
uh, his, the daughter who falls in love with, with Marie Marais uh, essentially dies of heartbreak because he goes off to the court and basically you know, um, uh, leaves her. And uh, um, there are a couple of scenes I would like to show if we have time. Uh, one is the, the, the amazing uh, first scene. By the way, there, uh, it, it's based on a book uh, by a man named Pascal Quignard, which exists in French and in English. It's a, quite a good English translation of it. So it's in, in English called All the Mornings of the World, which is a literal translation that I think makes a mistake by being too literal. In French, it's Tous les matins du monde. And I would have translated All the Mornings in the World, mm -hmm. because that's the colloquial phrase. Mm -hmm. Instead, they translate it to all the mornings of the world. It becomes like a kind of metaphysical mm -hmm. statement or something like that. But it isn't colloquial. The translation is nevertheless quite good. The movie does something that the translation, uh, the, the the author Pascal Quignard, uh, collaborated on the scenario, and they change it. In the in the book, it's a third person, an anonymous third person narrator, describing. So you have equal distance between the two characters. In the uh, story, every, the, the narrator is Marat Marais, uh, um, and, uh, who's played by Gérard de, uh, Depardieu. And the young Marat Marais is played by the son of Gérard de, uh, Depardieu, uh, Guillaume. And of course, this is totally extra. It's the only film that the two played in the same film, to my knowledge. Uh, some 10 years later, Guillaume was in a terrible motorcycle accident, which he caused him to lose a leg, and that, of course, completely stopped his career, and he finally committed suicide. So it's a very, you know, knowing that, it's not the film, but when, this is much longer, much after, much more after, but he's a very moving character, because he's very young, unsettled, and so on, and the father is, is quite old, dissolute, and the, uh, becomes the narrator. And it starts out this way, because I want, I'll tell you, because it's not a surprise of what happened, but I want you to focus on the the how rather than the what. Uh, the first scene, you see a close-up of uh, Marat Marais, aged, uh, looking awful. And by the way, uh, Gérard, I, I, I actually saw Depardieu one morning uh, in Paris at a bar where I was going to pick up some foie gras in Paris last December, and he really looked awful. <laughs> he looked that way, so I'm not sure, I don't know. Uh, he can really look awful. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, he, but um, he, they made him up even worse. His eyes are blotchy, and he's looking, you know, he's up toward the end of his career. And it takes place, the, 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 the opening scene is in the court of uh, Louis, in the music, the conservatory of Louis the, the court. And all you see is a huge close up of his face. And off, off the scene, you hear students practicing. And they're practicing, you know, in this conservatory, and he's sort of the master, you know, just sitting there, uh, totally impassive, uh, if not disgusted. I mean, you know, listening to this, and you hear the the his assistants giving instructions to the students, you know, do this, do that, a little louder, slower, and so on. And you have this very repetitive, uh, uh, you know, music, and, and then at a certain point, he interrupts. I want, you know, and uh, you have subtitles. Make sure we have to make sure we have English subtitles, mm -hmm. and says something that isn't in the original text, but that's very very interesting uh, 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 there. And so we will, you know, and then he he basically then says, "I'm going to tell you what music is really about. I'm going to tell you about my my life is a failure. Uh, my life is a failure." They say, "What, master? You're the great composer." He says, "No, no, you don't understand anything." And then becomes flashback, and he tells the story of his relation to Saint Colomb. You see, so that's the, uh, that's sort of the context of this uh, opening opening scene. <coughs> there you see in those zero one the, the master on the second is. So I think we can we can look at the first scenes, stop it, maybe discuss it, then look at the second scene, and then we can jump maybe if we have time to. Uh, one or two other things where you see the interaction of these two figures, the young Marat Marais and then, uh, and then saint Colomb. okay? And uh, the music is fantastic, uh, so I hope our sound system at least does a little bit of justice to it, but it's really, uh, it's really great. <laughs>
participated in it and it has this uh, this fantastic line uh, the notes have to die at the end finish by dying at the end and so on and it's all uh, the, whole, the whole configuration is the relation of music time and the experience of death uh, uh, he, uh, he uh, has you know totally uh, in terms of content he's totally sort of uh, uh, accepted now that he's in advanced age, he's sort of accepted the position of the teacher, uh, where before he was just trying to use the teacher as a way of, of, of acquiring success and, 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 and so on. Um, formally, what I find you know, very, very interesting there and very contemporary is this you know, focusing on the face. Uh, why is that interesting? I don't know. There's something very special about French news programs. Uh, I don't know if it's like this way in Portugal. It's not this way in the U.S. We have other problems in the But in the French news program, for example, you have enormous close-ups of the present, you know, the, 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 the anchor people who are all wearing, you know, extremely fashionable clothes that are provided by the designers and so on. Each, each night a different, you know, e elegant outfit and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the face, you see, the face is, uh, fills up everything. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, this has a tremendous uh, effect in your perception of the news, you see. It means that everything that's going on in the world basically can be reduced to the familiarity of a, of a face speaking to you, you see. The, the contrast of that in Europe is Euronews. In Euronews, which is a European uh, uh, television channel, they can't show you or they don't show you, you don't see the person speaking uh, out of practical reasons, but with very interesting sort of uh, results. Practical reasons, they have, they have to emit in about 16 different languages. You can get it in you know, different languages. So it would be very confusing to have to see somebody in, in speaking one language, you have to decide who. So the, you, you, the voice is always off, and the voice is different depending on the... Uh, and in the Euro News, they, they, they play very interestingly with the relation of voice and face. So for example, at the end of every 60-minute segment, they have a thing called no comment. Uh, where they'll show you a video clip with only the timeline on it, well, something like Buenos Aires and date, and time, or, or, or Bogota, or wherever they're doing it. And you have to figure out what's happening. There'll be no sound, no, the, the sound will be the sound of the video, but there's no voice over, and, and there's no music or anything like that. So that's the antipode. And when you see those two, you realize how important it is, independently of what's being said and shown. You know, if you have a face like that, uh, dominating and, and unproblematized, you see. What you have here is the opposite. You have, using that focus on the face, it becomes that everything connected with that face depends on what you don't see. You, it's not in the frame. First, you have the music coming from outside, the interaction with the, the hand putting the viola, you know, halfway in. Uh, the, 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 and above all, very, very effective when he says, close the shutters and the light. You know, uh, dims down and so on, and and uh, uh, and so forth. Um, all of those factors, you see, relativize the importance of the face as the iconic emblem of what I've been talking about—the self-contained individual. You see, if you think you can relate everything that's happening in the world uh, as basically oriented by the the face of the anchor person, and by the way, I find it, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, fascinating that uh, that this term develops an anchor person. It's the f if if reality consists of a of, a, of an unending uh, and fundamentally open play of signifiers or marks, the face anchors it, but it anchors it in a way that is uh, seems to be natural and seems to be intrinsic, and that's the ideological I would argue moment of it because it, it seems as if the face is the one who is then telling you what to uh, think and not to think, and so on and so forth. You know, in, in this connection, there's a, uh, I once saw an interview with Lenny Riefenstahl. Uh, and um, 
she was being pushed about, you know, her films being propaganda, the films she made under Hitler and so on, and how could, you know, uh, how could she make such propaganda films? She said, my films weren't propaganda films. Uh, what? How can you say that? He says, it's very simple. In propaganda films, you have a voice telling you what to think. In my films, and it's true, uh, both the film about Nuremberg and of the Olympian, there's no voice. The voices are coming from the film, but there's no off voice, a narrator, telling you what to think. And I remember the, uh, her, accuser to, her accusing critical uh, interviewers were speechless. They had no answer to that. <laughs> Whereas there is an answer, of course. Her films are highly political and propagandistic, but in the, in the way the images are set up and, uh, and not. But it's true what she was saying. You know, the, 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 the normal propaganda film, there's a voice always saying, and so the voice, and then the voice is then connected with a face that fills up the whole screen or, or close to it or organizes it, then you're, you're reassured about being in a world where anything that that voice can say, which is very simple, simple phrases, is going to be sufficient to orient you in understanding anything that's going to be shown uh, ar around you and so on. And so uh, this is what occurs to me in seeing one of the things. Uh, this huge, you know, for war, it's ex the exact opposite. It's a kind of deconstruct. I don't think he was thinking of that at all. Uh, but maybe he was thinking of portraits and certain certain functions of, of use of faces and so on. Uh, very striking, not in the book. It's a really very visual mm -hmm. thing. And, uh, uh, you know, very, for me, very effective. So it, and then, of course, you have the, the, the relation then of what is, is invisible but audible. Uh, both in terms of voice, sound, light, the conditions of visibility are not themselves visible, in, uh, at least in the in that the, the shuttering, you know, uh, controlling the light, and then the you know the uh, the music itself, which uh, embodies this this sense of this experience of time as uh, ephemerality, as mortal, and so on, and and and. and, and and so forth, and you know, sets up this contrast, which, by the way, um, in as far as we the little, the little we know about history, is not at all as clear as that. For example, uh, historically, there isn't that much. There's very little information about Saint Cologne because he really did live uh, uh, a hermit's life, and it's only through a kind of miracle that about in, in, I think about 40 years ago, some antiquarian discovered. His, his, the notebook he used in the movie, you see him keeping note in a beautiful red leather notebook, but he never let out and uh, with a lot of his compositions. So that up to that point, very, very little of his compositions were, had survived. And about 40 years ago, suddenly a whole slew of these compositions were able to. Uh, and one of the things he's playing there is called Tears. And it's what he, what he, what Saint Cologne writes as a result of what you're going to see in the first, in the second scene. The second scene, you see him playing there. Uh, that's Saint Cologne in the, in, the, in the flashback. And he's been invited to play music for uh, somebody living in his area who's in, the, who's in the process of dying and who wants to hear the music as he dies. And so he plays the music. And then when he comes home, he makes a very unpleasant discovery. So maybe we can. We can uh, uh, see that. So they say the same with you is like to be let die. To be let so die, die away. Die, die away. away. Yeah, yeah. So to die off. Die off. <laughs> the notes should die off at the end. Not just that, but die off at the end. Yeah. <laughs> also very interesting is the relation of uh, the relation of the different media of light uh, very influenced all the visuals are very influenced by uh, painting at the time and uh, uh, at a certain point I don't know if we can find that I'd like to see if I can find that scene maybe if we get to the the, the, the scenic the scene menu there he goes with the young Marin Marais who is a student uh, uh, to let's see now 
going to visit a painter friend of his. Um, uh, it's already at the end, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So go, go back. And try to get my hands to see which one is preparing. Probably maybe seven. See, he, he goes to visit a, a painter friend of his in Paris with Madame Marie. <coughs> I think this is, this is probably it, yeah. That's the young Madame Marie. Monsieur, il y a longtemps que je veux vous poser une question. Oui. Pourquoi ne publiez-vous pas les airs que vous jouez This wasn't the scene that I actually was looking for, but it's also interesting with the, the wind, the apparition of the, of, of the ghost and so on, and the fact that the wind is only wind after life, and the wind is what carries the music, and and the apparitions and so on. Uh, what I wanted to show was a scene where he goes with, with uh, the younger Marat Marais de Paris to a painter friend who actually paints, makes a painting that exists in the Louvre today of uh, the, little, the little cabane inside with the wafers and the violin and so on. And he has that painting, he has it painted uh, for him and ha he has a very interesting discussion with Marat Marais about music and, and lighting and so on. And, uh, um, uh, uh, just one last point that he says that uh, uh, it's the he gives a series of examples of things that are either music for him or light music and they're all this kind of rasping the, 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 the bark of a tree the Russian the, the bow across the thing it's all friction in some sense mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's very interesting that the touch there is what you can't have then beyond death what uh, you can have an apparition you can have wind carrying music and so there's a kind of interesting uh, uh, comparison between uh, uh, what you can touch, what you can't touch, and what touch produces, and so on. Uh, touch and time, and so on. So anyway, uh, if you're interested, the, the, the video is available. And the book is also very much, you know, if you like the, the style of it, with it's got very, very much worth reading, reading. So thanks very much for your <coughs> attention. And uh, I wish you all, you know, uh, a good trip home and, and, and so on, and we can keep in touch through email. And I guess I'll see you tonight at, after the after the uh, lecture, you know, at the party. Uh, Coming to the party? Huh? Coming to the party? Yeah, no. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> I don't know how long I'll, uh, I'm feeling sort of uh, a little weak, but uh, how long I'll be able to, but I'll be there. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you.